towards the South Atlantic and the Falkland Islands. Forty-five Allied warships were now after von Spee's blood. He had no illusions. We have at least contributed in a certain measure to the glory of our arms, although that cannot signify greatly against the enormous number of British ships. Unknown to each other, von Spee and Sturdy were steaming towards the same place at the same time, the Falklands. Sturdy arrived first. He was coaling in the morning after his arrival when he received the signal, a four-funneled and a two-funneled man of war in sight. The ships he was scouring the ocean for were sailing into his arms. The British crews worked feverishly to prepare their ships for the chase. Germans at first thought they had surprised a cruiser squadron. Then, suddenly, the Germans saw the tripod masts. Battle cruisers. They meant certain death. The battle cruisers swept out of the harbor. For three hours, they chased von Spee, eating up his 15 mile lead. At nine miles, sturdy open fire. Scharnhorst and the Gneisenau fought back gallantly, but they had no hope. We could feel one or two shots coming, and hitting us, we could hear, we could hear the shots piercing in the funnels and the superstructure and the case, casings. And, but we were assured from time to time from the bridge that all was going well. Sturdy's advantage was overwhelming. The British gunnery was uneven, and many shells that did land on target failed to pierce the German armor. Five hours before Scharnhorst sank, Gneisenau soon followed her. The Kent finished off the light cruiser Nuremberg. She was on fire, far and aft, and some of them were jumping into the water on bits of wreckage so as to try and get to us, but the seas were icy cold. We all had the impression that those Germans were very, very plucky people. I actually saw one man pull out the flag that was aft how I got hold of it and I saw him as he was sinking under the water, still waving that flag as that ship went down, much to say Deutschland still uber allies. Only one light cruiser escaped. Coronel was avenged at the expense of three quarters of the battle cruiser's ammunition and some disturbing questions about the quality of British gunnery. A month later, on the other side of the globe, another battle raised more questions, this time about British signalling. A British battle cruiser force in the North Sea met a smaller German one near the Dogger Bank. The heavy cruiser Blücher was badly hit and burning. She began to slow down. The British flagship, also damaged and her radio gone, flag signaled the other ships to continue chasing the fleeing Germans. But by a combination of mistakes, the whole force stopped pursuing and turned on the already doomed Blücher. annihilated her, brought her to rest, and uh, she was in a very bad position. But the most extraordinary thing about it was that she was healing over, and there must have been over a thousand men clambering up the deck onto the side of the ship. 
And as she steadily rolled over again, so they was sliding down the side of the ship into the water. The German battle cruisers escaped. Safe in harbour again after their brief foray, they returned to their old passive role. But recreation was not victory. The German fleet had little to show after six months of war except confirmation of the Kaiser's fears. The British Grand Fleet was too strong for them. Morale was in danger. The Kaiser had to issue a special order to his fleet. I urge you to maintain a spirit of cheerful fulfillment of duty, even when there has so far been no opportunity in the face of the enemy, or where in all human probability no such opportunity is likely to occur at all. The German Navy had failed. But the British had not entirely succeeded. Six months of war had revealed ominous weaknesses in British training. It was a fine training of character and seamanship in the long tradition of Drake and Nelson, but less adapted to the technology of modern naval war. At Dogger and Heligoland, there had been grave signaling errors. At the Falklands, Sturdy's guns took five hours to sink von Spee, whereas at Coronel, von Spee had destroyed Craddock in an hour. The main base at Scarpa Flow was still weakly defended against U-boats. Thoughtful observers noted defects in British equipment and in tactics. The long lack of a naval staff was beginning to tell. Yet the balance sheet was decidedly in Britain's favour. The German navy might still be powerful and intact, but her fleet was penned up in harbour, her merchant ships had disappeared from the seas, and all her colonies had been seized. first months of the war, the Royal Navy had done its job. Only a few sensed the absence of the Nelson touch and of the tremendous superior might of Nelson's day. 